Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. It is so great to see all these familiar faces. Um, and um, I cannot tell you how absolutely thrilling it is. Uh, I know that there's a lot going on, um, but uh, I can't tell you how thrilling it is to at least be able to have a return to campus conversation with you uh, for tonight and hopefully to have a similar conversation with the rest of our divisions and all in due time as things get figured out. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, I wanted to just start us off uh, with, with uh, a few words of Torah. Um, this week's Parsha is Parshat Ekev, and we see this beautiful uh, presentation uh, to the Jewish people who are about to actually uh, get their inheritance and get their land uh, that they've been waiting so long for and that, and that, and that, and that they have been longing for. And, and this presentation first says to, to the Jewish people, well, before we go in, first of all, let's remember what actually brought you to here. Let's actually remember what brought us here. And let's talk about all the miracles and all the trials and tribulations that actually got us to here. And let's also then talk about the responsibilities that we're going to have when we get there. And I think that this week's Parsha is very apropos for the time that we find ourselves in, that we are so excited. We're so thrilled to actually get back to our beloved campus, to get what we've been waiting so long for, you know, for the, for the campus that we've been longing for, the school community we've been longing to return to. And before we do, you know, it's important for us to also just take a step back and remind ourselves, because in this presentation to, to the Jewish people, it's very important because Hashem basically says, you know, we can, we can sometimes make the mistake of just thinking that we are in control of everything, that we really own everything, we're in control of everything, and just reminding the Jewish people that we are, we are the Jewish people. And we really believe that this is Hashem's world and that everything happens in ways that Hashem wants to happen. So just remember how we got to here. And there's a lot going on in the world. There's a lot going on in our community. There's a lot going on around us. And, you know, it gets us to reflect and this time has gotten us to take a step back and just understand that, you know, we are in our everyday professional and personal lives doing everything that we can to make the world a better place in our professions and our homes. And Hashem has reminded us over the last few months to just slow down and remember who really runs things and to just take a step back together and to appreciate the things that we have and to reflect on what, and so tonight we get to reflect on what brought us to here. And then we also get to hear from Rebecca in just a couple of moments about now that we are about to get back to our beloved campus and the place that we've been longing for, not just what got us to here, but also what kind of things can we expect when we come back in and what kind of new responsibilities are waiting for us along the way. So thank you for joining us tonight. And we are so thrilled and cannot wait to greet your children's smiling faces when they come back to campus. So more, Rebecca. Thank you, that was very apropos. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to see so many of you. Um, there's a lot of returning friends and a lot of new friends. Some of you I haven't even met yet. I can't wait to meet you and I'm sorry that we haven't had a chance to do so. Um, we really do miss being with the children and all of your families. Uh, we have several preschool Morot on the call with us this evening. Um, a couple of other administrators, thank you for joining us. Unfortunately, I have a little sad news to share. Mower Irene, one of our two-year-old assistants, just lost her mother this afternoon. Um, so our hearts and prayers go out to her and her family. It was quite sudden, not COVID-related, as my understanding. I think she's in Guatemala. Um, but um, we're so, so sad for her loss. Um, so we have a lot of information to share with you this evening. I'm kind of going to be reading a lot of my notes, forgive me for that. Um, Ellie Levine, our admissions director, and Sarah Stickerman, our director of marketing communications, are monitoring the chat. So if there's something that I don't address, please feel free to add it there. Um, we are also recording this session, so you can come back and listen if there's information that you miss. We'll be sending an email hopefully tomorrow morning with a link to the recording, some other links, some other helpful information, um, and a couple of stories that you can share with your children that I hope will be helpful. Um, you know, obviously this year will look very different, but I do want to assure you that we're still the same group of people who love the children and love your families, and we still have our same values. So everything comes from that place. So I want you to first understand a bit about why we're able to open the preschool. We hold what's called a letter of compliance from the Maryland State Department of Education Office of Child Care. It's a type of license that allows us to be known as a child care center. And under that license, we have permission to reopen the preschool. 
we do need to follow their guidelines as well as the Montgomery County Health Department's guidelines. And we also have our Berman Medical Task Force, which has been very, very invaluable in this process. Um, the guidelines include a lot of health and safety pro protocols, and I am, I can't tell you how grateful I am to have our preschool in a facility like Berman because we have so much uh, people support and physical support uh, in our building. So it makes me confident that we can carry out those guidelines. Uh, I want to talk a little about the transition back to school. Our first day will be Monday, August 31st. We'll have a half day for preschool that day. So we'll arrive at 8 and we will dismiss at 12. Um, and we'll give you many more details about that. And there will be some other important calendar dates that we will share with you also in our email tomorrow. As you've probably already heard, each class will be its own pod and the children in Morote will stay only with that pod. They will not physically mix. Uh, the classes can have a maximum of 15 bodies, that's children and adults in a room. So in our two-year-old class, that means 12 children and three morotes. Um, in our other classes, that's a max of 13 children and two morotes. Um, we are full in our twos. We're just about full of the waiting list in our pre-K, and our threes has a little bit of room. So if you know anybody looking, we have a couple of spaces for them. Um, so, of course, we want the children to have as smooth a transition as possible. Uh, so as soon as we're able to finalize our class lists, the MoRo will send you and your children a video introducing themselves. They'll introduce themselves without a mask and show what they look like with a mask and tell a little about themselves and about their class. And then as we're getting the classrooms ready, we'll send another video showing the children, this is what your classroom looks like, and these are some of the fun things we'll be doing. Um, we're also planning very, very small uh, playgroup visits the week before school. That will be the Wednesday, the 26th, and Thursday, the 27th. Um, we're going to assign you a date and time. If it doesn't work for you, please let me know. We're working on the safest way to do that. It's likely that we'll only allow one parent because in general, parents aren't supposed to visit the building, but we really want to ease the transition. So we'll limit the number of people can come. Um, that'll be one way we'll do that. If you feel that your child needs more support than we're offering for this transition, please let us know and we're happy to work with you um, to add some other uh, introductions. Um, so some of the protocols we'll be following, um, which by the way, we're still going to be simulating some of them because we're, we're still tweaking and we, we want to actually practice them. Um, at eight o'clock will be our first arrival time. Uh, you will be required to fill out a symptom and family questionnaire each morning. Uh, we will be having an app for you to do that on before you even leave your house. It should be pretty quick and straightforward. Um, and then when you get to campus, you will need to take your child's temperature using your own thermometer and show the thermometer to a Berman employee who will record the temperature. This is a, an Office of Child Care guideline. So you'll do that before your child gets out of the car we ask you to please wear a mask while the window is down or when you open your door. And so as soon as we record the temperature, we will back away and you will get out of your car and take your child out and then we'll take your child from you. Um, this is gonna probably take us a couple of days to master. And so we ask for your patience as we all adjust to that new routine. Um, so then one of the classroom teachers will meet your child and help them put their things in their locker. Um, you know, when the rest of the school comes back to campus, they likely won't be using lockers, but we, in the preschool, because the Morote are there to help uh, control the distancing around the lockers, we feel that we can do that. And we it really, it also, we need it as a place to keep their bedding separated when they're not using it, um, to keep all their, and some of their other uh, larger belongings. Um, of course, the kids will be taken to wash their hands almost immediately, and um, they'll be washing their hands quite frequently throughout the day. The Office of Child Care guidelines do not permit young children to use hand, sign, hand, excuse me, hand sanitizer, at least in a child care setting. So the hand washing is all the more important. Um, I am looking for other types of non-hand sanitizing cleaners like wipes that we can use if we go for a walk and we're not near a sink or something like that. But primarily our go-to will be soap and water. And I'm gonna ask a favor of you. Young children have a, a habit of putting their hands in the water, 
putting soap on their hands, and then while they're scrubbing, they put their hands right back in the water, and it washes the soap off before it's had a chance to do its job. So if you could please work with your children to um, water, then soap, sing ABCs, sing happy birthday at least two times, um, and really scrub everywhere, their fingers, the backs of their hands. People miss this area a lot. Um, and so if you could help us out by uh, teaching that to your children, of course, we will be teaching and reinforcing it when they come back to school. Um, some of the, uh, I, I think all of the bathrooms, if I'm not mistaken, will have at least one touchless faucet. Um, so that will be helpful. And anytime there isn't a touchless faucet, the children will be taught to use a paper towel to turn off the faucet. Um, masks are mandatory in Montgomery County for children ages two and over, not just in child care centers. Children are supposed to wear masks except when they're eating or napping or like if they're exerting outside, if they're running or climbing and we could help them maintain social distance, then they don't need to wear a mask. Then as a matter of fact, it's preferable they don't. Um, and um, I just want to tell you that I have several colleagues uh, that run Jewish preschools who have opened because they're 12 month programs and they've reopened and they are thrilled with how well the children are doing. They are very positive. The kids are doing a beautiful job with, um, with masks. Um, so we are really, um, we're very confident in that. Of course, there will be exceptions. There are children who are not have a developmental reason why they can't wear a mask or a medical reason why they can't wear a mask. Um, and so it's all the more important that those who can do. Um, and I'm also going to send you a social story about wearing masks that, um, that I'd like you to read with your children. One thing that I, um, I have read repeatedly is that there is research, research that shows that children are more willing to protect others than themselves. So that's a nice little message too. And I'll also be sending you like a, a list of cute tips for, um, for helping them learn to wear masks, like masking their, um, their stuffed animals and things like that. And it's, a, it's a cute list that um, I came across that I hope will be helpful. Um, someone did ask about face shields. Face shields are not a substitute for masks for either adults or children. They can, are meant to be worn in conjunction with masks. My understanding is that um, people are using them mostly to protect the eyes because the mask does protect the mouth and nose and the mask does need to be worn over the mouth, mouth and nose. Some of the Moro will be wearing uh, shields with their masks. Um, we're supposed to uh, maintain social distancing as much as possible unless we're giving direct care. Well, in our preschool, of course, direct care includes bathrooming and diapering and helping uh, with food and things like that. But it also still means hugs. It still means letting a child sit on our lap. Um, we, I would not be comfortable opening a preschool where we can't still show the children love and affection. Um, someone very kindly asked about keeping the teachers safe. I appreciate that. But we are confident that wearing masks and wearing shields um, do offer the best protection. We are considering either some kind of an apron for the teachers or a smock, or, and we'll keep changes of clothes. So if a child is, is unhappy and has some tears, maybe we will um, you know, change our, our clothes at that point, or if a child isn't feeling well. And of course, always, always, always hand washing. Um, we, we recognize that social distancing is not developmentally the way children roll. Um, so, but there are times where we really can do it during nap the, or a rest period. The cots will be um, six feet apart and the kids will lay one kid child's head here and one, I'm trying to get in the camera, the child's head here and, um, and somebody else's feet, right? So it's every other's head, feet, head, feet and, um, and six feet apart. Um, for lunch, we will have a few children at tables and we also bought lap desks. And so some of the kids will be on the lap desks and on the tables, and so we'll be able to separate them that way. Um, I'm also hopeful that we'll be able to eat outside a lot. Um, I just spoke to our maintenance staff this afternoon, and we're going to have um, outdoor sinks, hopefully in a couple places where we don't currently, because one of my concerns with eating lunch outside is that we have to have access to soap and water. I don't want them to wash their hands with soap and water in the classroom, and then by the time they get outside, I don't know what they've touched, and then they're eating, and they need to wash afterward also. So I want access to um, soap and water. So um, we'll, we'll see where we're going to eat for that, but we will be able to social distance. Um, we're going to minimize sharing supplies. Each child will have their own set of non-washable art supplies, Play-Doh, anything like that um, that's, you know, that we can't wash or sanitize. 
we're going to structure playtime to reduce the number of children playing in a given area at the same time, and that will allow them to have a little more distance. Um, and that's actually a nice way to give kids a chance to um, make choices of where they want to play and sometimes having to take turns because there's too many people in one area now. We'll make charts. Three people can be in this area, two people can be in this area, and that, um, that gives them some visuals also. Um, we'll be cleaning washable toys at least daily, um, toys that can't be easily cleaned, like something that maybe we could spray but not wash with soap and water, then that we would only use every few days. We would only bring it out every few days. Um, only one pot is allowed on the playground at a time, um, which right now, like I'm really sorry that the other students aren't coming, but the good news for us is we have a lot of space to use right now. So um, yes, one pot on the playground, but we have a track. For those of you who haven't been on our campus, we have First of all, inside we have a very large gym. We have a track and field. We have two courtyards. We have another adjacent field. We have tennis courts. We have a lot of places where um, we can spread out to play and there's plenty of places to take walks. Um, and, and when everybody else comes back, we'll share and we'll take turns. We, we've learned. Um, the school has also bought um, sail shades, I think they're called, and so they'll, they'll give us some shade and they rotate with the sun. So um, they're putting those in a few places around campus to allow us to be outside. Um, our specialists will meet with the children outside whenever possible. We have uh, our gym teacher, Maura Sharon Pratt, our music teacher, Maura Leacott, and we have a new EBRI teacher. Some of you may know Maura Yvette Epstein. We're very excited to welcome her. Um, and the reason we need new um, the new, um, new EFRI teachers, because Mora and Nat is going to be teaching Lima Day Cottage full day in kindergarten this year. Um, and when we can't be outside, our task force feels that the specialists can come into the room, sit at a far distance, have no physical contact, and then when they leave, we will clean their spot. We, we think that it is important for them to be in the presence of the children, albeit at a distance. Um, Rabbi Uri will continue to sing with the kids on Rosh Chodesh most likely over Zoom and blow the shofar and be with us on Chagim and he and I are gonna meet very soon to figure out the, the most fun way to do that. Um, each classroom is also getting a projector so we can do some learning with the, um, like the two pre-K classes can learn together or the pre-K can work with the twos or we, we have ways that we can, uh, we can work together, virtual visitors, virtual field trips. If a child has to quarantine, and I'll say more about that in a second, they'll be able to Zoom in the classroom for at least part of the day um and and it's possible that a pod would have to at some point we i and hara and then we would continue to have um, live classes over zoom the moron have been in a virtual learning boot camp um, because we always want to improve our practice um, regarding quarantine the health department will make all decisions regarding who if anyone needs to quarantine so and we for those of you who may not know we have a school nurse on campus and she already has um, many contacts at the health department. She's been in touch with them. And um, so we're glad that she's there to facilitate those calls. But each case will be um, individual and the health department will make those decisions. So I, as I hope you can see, we're doing everything we can to minimize risk. And we're also asking for your help. Um, we're asking you to minimize your exposure you know, outside of school, use PPE as been recommended. You follow the CDC guidelines, follow the governor's gu guidelines regarding travel. Um, we were just asking for your help to um, help us take care of all the children and families. Um, like I said, after the call, we'll be sending the recording of this and a link to the Shuba Bashava blueprint, which will tell you all of the cleaning and sanitiz sanitization protocols that are being put into place um, across Berman. Um, I did, I, I almost, I was going through the protocols, I realized I wasn't saying anything about learning. Um, even though we have all these new procedures and it seems like that will take so much of our time, but there are so many opportunities within that to help children construct knowledge, right? We have Torah values of caring for each other and caring for the environment. Um, pods allow us to think about numbers and sorting and counting um, and um, everything's gonna be labeled. There's gonna be signage. So there's even more of a print rich environment. Um, so I'm, uh, you know, our first thought was, okay, health and safety and everything else is gravy. And then we realized there are so many opportunities to incorporate um, learning into this and socialization. By the way, children are sometimes give us the best ideas for how to do these things. So we'll still be tweaking things once the children come because they're going to think of things we haven't thought of yet. 
Um, we want to know how many of you would still like your children to ride the bus and at least while the other divisions are virtual, I can't promise beyond that, we may be able to provide aftercare. Um, and I, ho I hope that might alleviate some of your stress. So we're gonna send a survey in the email tomorrow morning. And I'm sorry, we need a quick turnaround. We're asking for your responses by Friday um, because we need to know if we have enough kids to um, help us or few enough or, or enough to um, help us maintain the pods like for aftercare. We have ideas of how to do that and um, enough kids to make the bus uh, financially viable. Um, hot lunch will still be available. Uh, you can still sign your child up for the year if you haven't already done so and we'll send um, that link as well. Um, I think that's about everything I have planned. Um, Ellie and Sarah, how are we doing with the chat? There's one question um, that I want to jump back to about being able to walk up during carpool um, or walking your child into the classroom during those first couple of days of school. Right, so um, technically you cannot walk your child in. Um, I think, you know, if we have a child who's really struggling, then we will um, have to talk that through with you. Um, but for now, we, that's why we're trying to ease the transition um, and um, meet the children, ahead, you know, let the children see who we are ahead of time and meet them at those small play dates. And we're hoping that will be helpful. Um, I, I think if you're walking up that you, just, but you, you can, but you have to walk up to the carpool lane. But the one caveat is the um, Office of Child Care is literally still tweaking their guidelines and I, something just came out right before this call and I think that was addressed, so I need to double check it and I'll, and I'll let you know. Um, it's possible you have to come in your car um, or we have to think of a way for you to social distance, like maybe we'll have a couple of tables so you stand on the other side of the table, take your, take your child's temperature, show us a thermometer and walk, right? As long as we can maintain that social distance, we're gonna have extra support other people out at the carpool lane um, who will be able to help us maintain that social distance. So I'm hopeful that we can make it work. I just want to double check that the guidelines don't say we can't. I think they're going to say we just have to social distance. Sorry, that was a little long-winded. I hope it answered the question. Anything else, Sarah? Can you talk a bit about school supplies um, and when and how they would be brought to school? Oh, so um, in, that will be another link um, that we'll send you tomorrow. It was actually in um, one of the school-wide emails that went out recently. Um, you can bring them either to, that, to the play date um, or you could give us a bag on the first day if you're not able to come before. That would be fine. Please, please, please label everything. Everything, please label it. <laughs> we appreciate that. I hope that helps. Just looking back to see if there's anything missed. Um, there was a couple of questions just about the class placements. I think you mentioned that um, you'll be sending them out and teachers will be reaching out. Um, right. So yeah, that, that's um, right. the teachers will reach out and let you know that they're they're, they're your child's teacher. Um, we we really need to wait. You know, to, um, there are still people who are making some decisions. A couple of people moving into the area. Um, we, uh, the aftercare uh, survey will also help us um, answer that question. So for example, if we have X number of pre-K kids who want to stay for aftercare and it's um, within the 13 kids in one pod, then those kids would go into the same pod. So they're together from eight till whenever they leave um, aftercare. So we're, we're just, we're not ready yet to, uh, to finalize our class placements. Um, we're, you know, I, I'm hoping for, if not next week, for sure by the week after. So I ask for your patience with that. There's a question just about supplies for the classroom. So blankets, diapers, wipes, bringing all of that, but how often will things be, be sent home for cleaning? Oh, so, okay, so on the supply list, um, it was just mandated that the um, bedding needs to come home weekly. So we're gonna send it on Friday and you'll return it on Monday. I will try my best. Somebody remind me to remind myself um, to send you a reminder on Sundays to send the, to send the bedding back. 
um, may pay to have more than one set. Um, all of those details are on the supply list for new parents. Um, we supply the diapers and wipes and we collect a diaper fee. Um, and so we'll ask for it at the, at the beginning and then two or three times throughout the year, depending on how many kids are, how, you know, if your child gets trained, then you don't have to make that last payment. <laughs> um, so, um, so it's hard for me to predict exactly how many payments we'll need. But all of that information will be on the supply list and we'll link that tomorrow. There's a, uh, by the way, a lot of forms. I apologize, <laughs> um, but please try to pay attention. We've got to have health immunization. There is absolutely no leeway this year. More, I see Miriam Kotek, our nurse on the call, nodding her head. There is no leeway. Your child cannot come to school without their health and immunization forms completed. There's also an emergency form from the Office of Child Care that must be completed. There's other forms that, as well, but those are the most important. And if your child has allergies, there's an allergy action form. Um, and um, some of those forms do need to be signed by your physician, so please check those out quickly. Um, the forms that Mara Rebecca just mentioned will be sent and linked in the email tomorrow um, as well. Um. I see somebody said, so students who don't nap um, don't need bedding. The, um, all of our children do have a rest period and we actually, um, we think it's um, less chance of contamination if they have their own um, ro sleeping roll or mat or something that's kept in their locker. And then um, again, that will also come home to be cleaned unless it's something that we can spray and wipe, um, then it could be kept in school. Um, the mats that we were supplying generally get stacked and they're too big to fit into the lockers. And I, I just don't think that that's a viable option for this year. So we're requesting that you send a sleeping roll or a sleeping bag or um, like for the napping kids, you could do a crib sheet and a blanket, but the one piece things um, I think are, um, we're gonna put them in a, in a giant, you know, big plastic bag and put it in the locker and it's easier if it's something that just rolls up and gets put away. And also then the children learn to help. So just with their own, and then the teachers will wash their hands, and the children will wash their hands, and then we'll help the next time. Um, there's a question about if the nurse decides someone um, to send someone home under suspicion of COVID. Um, so we actually have a, a decision tree in the Shuba Vishava blueprint um, that goes over all of the different elements as far as if there's a suspicion with negative tests, positive tests. Um, so we'll send that out tomorrow, um, and it will go over all of everything that needs to happen. If they need to get a negative result before coming back to school, all of that is, is in there. And again, the, the health department, what right, Miriam, will also be contacted um, each time and, and the, the Office of Child Care um, will be contacted as well. Correct. Um, I think that we caught all of the questions. Um, I think I can turn it if people have and they want to unmute themselves if we didn't if we didn't get to your question because the chat did go a little quickly at, at times. The rest period is after lunch. Somebody asked about rest period that's after lunch. Anybody else? And by the way, you can get in touch with me anytime. I'm happy to speak to you individually. Um, I'm happy to answer emails. Um, I, I'm not full time in the building yet, but certainly email me and I'll take several time to talk. Somebody trying to ask something? Um, the timing of the rest period, um, you know, it really depends um, on the kids. It's a minimum of about 20 minutes to a half hour um, if we find the kids. And, and really some of it is just to give them a break from the, you know, we, we concentrate on helping them socialize all day. And sometimes they just need a break from each other. They need a little bit of downtime. They need a little bit of quiet time. So that's the goal. Um, if, you know, if they're, it's just not happening, we might let them get up sooner if, if they all seem very calm and quiet. And then a lot of classes will let them take something to their sleeping area to play with or a book to read or something like that. Um, and if they're all calm and quiet, we might give them a little bit more time. So that's a play by ear kind of thing. The nappers, um, the kids go to sleep um, 
right after lunch, so that's usually around 12.30 or so, and they sleep as late as 2.30, quarter to three, because then we really need to get ready for dismissal. Um, we do find there are children who are starting to, um, parents will call us and say, they're not sleeping at night, can you back up their nap to an hour, to half an hour, um, and, and we will do our best to work with you on that. I see that we have a couple of questions about um, kindergarten. Sorry for jumping in. No, go ahead. Um, we have been working very hard. Um, you know, as as I when I opened up, I said I know that there's a lot going on uh, with with guidelines coming out pretty rapidly. Uh, there were some updated guidelines that came out today. Uh, we've been working with um, with uh, uh, more Rebecca and with Rachel Hanloff uh, on getting our kindergarten to operate under the same licensing. Uh, as the preschool, so uh, we're, we're just going through the process now. Um, we, we don't want to get everybody's hopes up, but we are hopeful that we can make that happen. We are committed to working to make that happen. So um, Rachel Hanloff, who's on this call, and Rebecca have been teaming up to make it happen for our families, and uh, I'm really grateful uh, to them for doing that. Um, we just need to walk through a couple of steps so before we can officially announce um, and before we get anybody's hopes up, we just need to do to take a couple of steps and um, it's not just based on our timeline, but on the licensing office and when they can come mm -hmm. out and things like that. So um, we will keep you posted in the next few days and let you know about our progress, but we are hopeful and we will keep working to make that happen. I see that um, Mrs. Kotek, I don't know if you can answer this, but um, people are asking what kind of thermometer we recommend. Do we have a recommendation on that? Can you, can you unmute? She's saying no. <laughs> Hi, um, I don't know that I have a specific recommendation. I have the um, Exergen thermometer in my office. It's a temporal thermometer, just a far head. Um, I think it's like $18 at Costco. So you're welcome to try that if you'd like. Um, school um, begins at eight and ends at 3.30 if that's what you registered for. Again, you can let us know if you're interested in aftercare. Um, there is also a 12.30 uh, dismissal option. Um, uh, sunscreen, if um, we can apply sunscreen with a written note from you, um, you know, they haven't said anything about that regarding COVID. I can't imagine that that's a problem as long as we wash our hands between children. Um, and so you're, you have to supply it and you have to give us written permission to do it. And we keep a log of uh, when we apply. That's true of any cream. That's true of diaper cream. Any, anything that we apply, um, we need written permission and we keep a log. Um, you're, people are asking when we might know about kindergarten, you know, we're a little bit dependent on other people. So the you know, best that we can tell you, I think, is as quickly as possible. Um, um, we're hoping to do everything we need to on our end by the end of this week. Um, and then um, we have to wait for um, the Office of Child Care um, to respond. And they did promise they would be as quick as possible, but they can't guarantee it. So how's that for an answer, Dr. Chris, Rabbi Dr. Chris Mann? Are we okay with that? Okay. Um, the uh, potential aftercare is um, you have a choice of registering until 4.30 or 5.30. So that will be one of the survey questions. Um, anybody see anything else? Oh, thank you. We're getting a little love over here. If, I, if we missed your question, please, again, please feel free to email any of us um, and, uh, and hopefully, and you can listen to this again. And also, again, we'll send a lot of information in the morning. I just want to reiterate that, you know, our primary goal is to love the children. I'm going to get emotional. To love the children and um, to keep them healthy and safe. And, you know, yes, we look a little different, but Berman still has the same heart. So um, we look forward to seeing all of you. <laughs> um, very soon. Now I'm getting really excited. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Good night, everybody. Can't wait to see you all.